today's reading will come from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and I'll be reading from the New King, or the King James Version today. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Evangelism, a word most often heard where people assemble to worship. What is evangelism? Several definitions could be given, but evangelism is the general process by which the good news of salvation from sin through Jesus Christ is announced as being available to all people everywhere. Preachers stand up and encourage the people to get busy in the work of the Lord. Everyone listens, and shakes hands, and says, good job. And yet, the overwhelming majority goes right on back to doing whatever they did or did not do regarding evangelism. Why? Well, the simple answer is positive change often takes time. We're doing our best to understand and implement the various expectations placed upon us by God through the scriptures in order to be considered faithful servants of righteousness. We answer and ask and answer the question almost weekly, what must I do to be saved? Well, what we're looking at this month is what must I do to stay saved? So we're looking at the broad aspect of faithfulness. And recall this, we are faithful servants of righteousness. And what do servants do? Servants serve their masters. So let's this morning discuss five principles concerning what it means to be faithful in evangelism. And our sermon is entitled, Faithful in Evangelism. Those who've been in the men's training class, you'll notice the five points of this sermon. You, you got this, but you just didn't get all the meat on it. So you got the bones, but now we'll give the meat. In the first place, in order to be faithful in evangelism, we must understand the commands. We're going to notice three passages. Let's begin in Matthew 28. This is often considered one of the accounts of the Great Commission. The difference between the Great Commission and the so-called Limited Commission is the scope. And I think we'll understand the scope of the Great Commission as recorded in Matthew 28 beginning in verse 18. This is a command watch. And Jesus came and spake unto them, that's specifically the eleven, saying, All power, that is all authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world Amen. Now this statement was made by Jesus to the 11 remaining apostles of Christ. Now as you look at it, look at verse 19, go ye therefore. The go of verse 19 reads like an imperative in English, but it is really an incidental. The meaning in our tongue would be more like as you go, meaning and implying that we're all going somewhere. Where are you going tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? I do think tomorrow's a holiday, so tomorrow might be a little bit more of an off day. But more than likely, you're going to be going somewhere. So as we go, what are we to do? Teach all nations. What happens when people are taught correctly? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Then what? Do you turn them loose? No, Jesus says teach them again. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So as we go about our lives, we are to teach every person willing to listen. You do understand that most people talk about the things they love and enjoy. True or false? Most of the time, people talk about the things they love and enjoy. Do we love Christ? If we love Christ, then we can't help but talk about Christ. Do we love the gospel? 
then we can't, be, we can't help ourselves, can we? We have to talk about Christ and the gospel because we want to talk about the things that we love and the things that we enjoy. So in all our goings about life, what do we need to do? Brethren, let's evangelize. Let's talk about the truth. There's one passage. But I don't want you to go with me now to the book of Philippians. And notice another command here in Philippians 4. Book of Philippians 4 and verse number 9. Philippians is the book of joy. You'll see joy rejoice time and time and time again throughout this epistle. But observe what the Bible says in Philippians 4 and verse number 9. We understand the inspired writer of Philippians to be the apostle Paul. Okay? Philippians 4 9 says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, what did he say? Think about it. Ponder in your mind. What did he say? He said, Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Now Paul gave a principle in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now have we really paid attention to the book of Acts? Did Paul practice evangelism in both private and public settings? What did the man write by inspiration? Those things, would that include evangelism? Would that include private evangelism? Would that include public evangelism? Everywhere he went. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen. Now we haven't seen the Apostle Paul with our eyes, but we've seen him in the eyes of our mind according to what things are written down in the Bible, right? In me, in an inspired apostle of Christ so long as he followed the Lord, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, what did he say? Did he say, think about it? Is that what that means? Did he say to discuss amongst yourselves? Those things that we've seen Paul do, we're to sit around and just talk about. Right? That's not what the man wrote by inspiration. What did he say? Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. That means it's time for us to implement in each one of our lives exactly what Paul did. Did he practice private evangelism? Well, don't worry, we'll get there. Did he practice public evangelism? Oh, don't worry, we'll get there. So do we see the commands as laid out? I got one more for you. Turn to our scripture reading in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. First and 2 Timothy and Titus are the evangelistic epistles. They're written, obviously the Holy Spirit inspired the, the apostle Paul to write these things to evangelists, to two gospel preachers, Timothy and and Titus. Observe what 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2 says. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou. That is addressed to the evangelist, the preacher. The same commit thou to faithful men. Not just males only, men and women. Faithful humans. Who shall be able to do what? Teach others also. This verse, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, sets forth the eternal principle that when followed will cement the Lexington Church of Christ in the truth so long as time continues. So we ask, who are those willing to be faithful students regarding evangelism? What did he say? The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to who? Faithful men, faithful people. Who's willing to be a faithful student in evangelism? I remember reading in the Old Testament one time, book of Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 8. The Lord asked in this theophany, this inspired vision, Whom will I send? And who will go for us? You know what Isaiah said? Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. You know what we say? Here am I, send them. Here am I, Lord, send somebody else. Here am I, Lord, don't ask me to do evangelism. Don't ask me to evangelize. Send somebody else. What was the attitude of the prophet of old? I'm here. I'll go. 
Send me. And incidentally, think back to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. We're all going somewhere. As we go about our lives, what are we to do? Teach everybody. What happens when people are properly taught? They'll be baptized in the name by the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then what do we do? We teach them again. Friends, can we see the commands of evangelism? Who's going to implement the clear commands of the New Testament? There's just three. They don't take but one. But there's three principles laid out right there that we're all to practice evangelism. Now in the second place, consider this. In order to be faithful in evangelism, we must possess conviction. Conviction regarding two primary things, sin and salvation. Sin is missing the mark established by God in his word. Sin is wrongdoing. Sin is a violation of divine law. Hence, 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. All sin is ultimately against God and separates the one who commits the sin from fellowship with God. Isaiah wrote in the long ago, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, how universal of a problem is that? How universal of a problem is sin? Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned. Every person who is going to give account to God has sinned. For all have sinned. That doesn't mean the babies or those with insufficient mental capabilities. But generally speaking, as I look around, that's the majority of people in this auditorium right now. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, some of the wonderful results of sin are shame. Genesis 3, 7 and 8. Sadness. Genesis 3, 9 and 10. Suffering. Genesis 3, 16 to 19. And unless washed away and cleansed by the blood of Christ, eternal separation. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, do we have conviction regarding these things? Do we have any conviction regarding what the Bible teaches about sin? Sin causes us to be lost, and time alone erases nothing. Do we understand that? That the sins that we committed all those years ago, that we maybe can't even remember well, unless that has been washed away by the blood of Christ, God still holds that against us. Do we understand that? Do we have conviction in our heart regarding those things? Well, there's sin, but now salvation. Salvation is available to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Go with me to the book of Romans. Let's observe a passage here in Romans 10 that is often misused. Some of our religious friends will try and say that calling on the name of the Lord is a strictly Jewish thing to do. Well, you don't get that from Romans 10. Observe the text in Romans 10 and verse 11. For the scripture saith, now observe this brethren, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12, for there is, how many differences? There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto how many? Unto all. Do you read that text and say calling on the name of the Lord is limited to the Jews? No, you don't get it from that text. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever, Jew, Gentile, male, female, doesn't matter. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then someone says, here's how you do that. You say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Save me from my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God. Wash me from my sins. I didn't, did you read that there? Did you, did you read all that from the text of the Bible? Did you know that an inspired apostle of Christ taught people 
how to call on the name of the Lord. Did you know this? Go me the book of Acts chapter 2. And let's see how an inspired apostle of Christ, speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, taught people to call on the name of the Lord. Okay? Does that sound fair? Do we have conviction regarding sin? If we do, then we'll have conviction regarding salvation. Notice Acts 2 and verse number 16 beginning. But this, Acts 2, is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The things prophesied by Joel in Joel 2, 28 to 32, some of them began to unfold right there in the book of Acts. So we don't really have to wonder too much about what Joel prophesied about in Joel 2, 28 to 32 because Peter, an inspired apostle, said what? This, Acts 2, is that Joel 2. Skip ahead to verse 21 because this is the end of Joel's prophecy and Peter quotes it. What does Peter say in Acts 2.21? And incidentally the other apostle. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall do what? Call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Now who introduced that? An inspired apostle said this is that. Here we're getting an understanding and an application of Joel 2 and Acts chapter 2. Let's read it. We're not going to read every word, but you go back and read where Peter said, get down on your knees and pray to Jesus. That's what men tell us it means, but that's not what it means. Look in this text, skipping forward to verse number 38, or 36 rather. Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ, both Master and Messiah. Now when they heard this, what pricked their hearts? It wasn't somebody over there playing on a mechanical instrument of music. It wasn't a drama play or a skit. It was plain, simple gospel preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, Peter already told them what they needed to do. What did they need to do? You need to call on the name of the Lord. Joel had said that not long ago. Guess what Acts 2.38 is? Acts 2.38 is how everyone calls on the name of the Lord. It means to do what God says do. What does God tell us to do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's simple. How do we call on the name of the Lord? We do what God tells us to do. What does God tell us to do regarding salvation? Summarized, it's repent and be baptized. Look down at verse 41. Then they that, it doesn't say madly. Some people probably get mad about it. It doesn't say then that sadly, they were already pricked in their heart. They felt bad. Once they, Jesus was preached to them, they realized you crucified the Son of God. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Why were they baptized? For the remission of sins. And the same day, it doesn't say two weeks later, does it? It doesn't say when they got enough to go down to the river. It says the same day there were added, they didn't join a thing, were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Isn't that amazing? What happens when you call on the name of the Lord? You're saved. Do you see that? What happens? In order to be saved, I must be baptized. Immersed in water for the remission of sins. Well, when I'm immersed in water for the remission of sins, where does the Lord add me? Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added. Who adds? The Lord. The Lord adds the saved to where? The Lord added to the church, the church, not a church, the church daily such as should be saved. Wait a minute. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The saved are added to the church. They were added to the church when they were baptized. Do you see that the saved are the baptized and the baptized are the saved and the saved are those who call on the name of the Lord? Now men say all kinds of stuff. That's right there in the Bible. Do we have any conviction regarding these things? Let me tell you what's the truth. If your mother's still alive, you need to be nice to her. You need to love your mother. But your mother has sinned. Odds are exceedingly high that your mother has sinned. Has Jesus washed away the sins of your mother, your brother, your father, your sister, your neighbor? Pick a person.
because all this ties in with being faithful in evangelism. Number three, in order to be faithful in evangelism, we must possess credibility. Credibility. Quick illustration. How long have you held your current job? Pretty good while. How long have you known your co-workers? Pretty good while. Friends, we've all established rock-solid credibility with someone. Someone speaks highly of you. There's no doubt of that in my mind. Now, whether with our friends, our family, our co-workers, or our literal neighbors who live beside us or across the road or down the road, whatever, most members of the Lord's church have great reputations. Most people are going to talk about members of the Lord's church in a good manner. Now, they might not know that you're a member of the Lord's church, but they know you show up at work on time. You don't steal from the register, whatever it may be. You're fair, you're honest in all those things, and people, even the lost, will respect that. And we have established rapport, or we have credibility with these people. Don't we? Yes, because, now there was an illustration. Here's the fact. Human interaction is inevitable. We talk about, I'm going to build 20-foot high walls around my house and I'm not going to even let the mailman in the door. That doesn't happen that way, does it? <laughs> it's not, that's not how it is. So human interaction is inevitable. Faithful Christians interact with sinners on a regular basis, if not every single day. People respect those who show up on time and don't have loud, obnoxious, drunken parties in the backyard. Right? Let's put some Bible on this. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. Let's observe something in 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12, and then we'll look forward in verses, or chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You want me to tell you what I believe? By and large, most members of the church obey that. By and large, we understand that, don't we? Verse number 12, having your conversation. That doesn't imply just our speech, but it does imply our conduct, our manner of life. And as far as that goes, the way we talk to other people is kind of implied in conversation. Having your conversation honest among who? Honest among the Gentiles. Generally speaking, honest among the non-members of the church. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, sometimes people speak against us. But by and large, that doesn't happen all the time, does it? That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may buy your what? Human interaction. What is it? Good works, which they shall behold, they see it, glorify God in the day of visitation. Human interaction is inevitable. Flip the page if your Bible's like mine and observe 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer, a defense, to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Look, having a good conscience. Now, do we have a good conscience regarding evangelism if we do nothing? If we literally let our literal neighbors across the road die in their sins, how can we have a good conscience when we haven't even tried? Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, that happens sometimes, but look, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Like it or not, every one of us has established credibility with someone Who's lost? You want me to tell you by and large who you listen to? The people you know. The people you respect. The people that you've been in the trenches with. And you've seen this guy, this woman. They're straight up. They're honest. Now if we're going to ultimately work on evangelism, we're going to have to utilize some of the credibility that we have established with people through the years. Number four. In order to be faithful in evangelism, we must possess and demonstrate, here's where most people get lost, courage. Courage. So far, 
in this sermon, most members of the church have had no problem with the things presented, but there is a difference in understanding, agreeing, and implementing. Go get them, preacher. Preach the word, preacher. Wait a minute. Because this puts the finger on us ever one. Now it's not, it's not so go get them no more, preacher. Calm down, preacher. Don't do this anymore, preacher, because the dividing line with us is courage. This is what it boils down to. It's not understanding. It's not that we don't have to go back and look over the commands. It's courage. Now, we falter when it comes to implementation. Why? Well, let's, we could give a laundry list of excuses, can't we? I don't know enough. I can't talk about the Bible with anybody. I don't know enough. Well, you know what you did to become a Christian? Book chapter. How, how does somebody who comes right up out of the water not know what they heard, what they read, in order to say, I can show somebody what I did to become a Christian? You'll never know enough. So you know what? You can always use that excuse. Even somebody who might have the whole Bible memorized from cover to cover, they might say, well, I, I might miss something. That's an excuse. Well, I'm too nervous. Join the club. That's what courage is all about. Get over yourself. Didn't Jesus say, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Every one of us has to get over our own ego, little me. We have to get over that and implement what we know to be right. Well, what about this excuse? It'll ruin our relationship. If talking to somebody about their soul and Christ and the gospel ruins a relationship, you didn't have nothing anyway. Newsflash, I'm ready. Somebody, please, I don't care what religion they're from. Come talk to me about my soul. Who cares enough about me to come talk to me about my soul? You ain't going to make me mad. You have my full permission. I don't care what religion it is. If you want to show interest in my eternal well-being, let's talk about it. Am I the only one in the world like that? Would you get offended if somebody tried to talk to you about your soul? Do you think your neighbors will? We'll tell ourselves that in our minds, won't we? Oh, I'll, I'll have a bad reputation among my neighbors. So, what are they going to tell? This guy wants to be sure that you're ready when you die. Doesn't that sound awful? Boy, that's horrible, isn't it? There's public enemy number one. This guy wants to be certain that we're ready for eternity. There, you go talk bad about that guy, right? <laughs> well, here's another excuse. So-and-so does it so much better than me, so just let so-and-so do it. Well, there's one or two or a handful. Look, look around. If one or two or a handful could do good, what could this crowd do? Look at what the Lord did with essentially 13 men. The 12, after Judas Iscariot, did what he did. Matthias is added to the 12 and Paul. Look what the Lord did with essentially 13 men. I don't know, but I'm sure if I started counting, there's more than 13 males in here. 13 Christian males. Right here, right now. Hey, then what could we do? It doesn't hinge on knowledge. It hinges on courage. We're members of the one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So here's an open invite. You let me borrow your credibility with people, and I'll bring all the courage you can stand with. I'll bring it by the bucket for you. You understand that? You have established credibility with how many people who've never met me in their life. They don't know me from Adam. But they know you, don't they? They have a relationship with you. Let me borrow your credibility and I'll bring courage by the bucket for you. And I'm not the only one in here with courage. Do you understand that? We're working together. We're not working against one another. We're in this together, aren't we? Use your credibility. And I'll bring the courage, and let's see what happens. Huh? Open, open invite. I told men in the training class, heard this weeks ago. Open invitation. The whole church. Whoever you want talk, you go with me and I'll do it. Is that fair? Is that fair? Boy, it's ain't you know, now he's going to, now he's making me have to have the courage to talk to somebody. Yeah. That's exactly right. You ain't going to put it off. We have to deal with this. Now, if we're too scared to act, 
then it's time to examine our personal faith. Go with me back to the book of Acts. One way that you could study the book of Acts is by use of words. And one of the key words, believe it or not, in the book of Acts is some form of the word bold. Bold. What do you think bold is, Curry? Acts 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw, these unbelieving Jews saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That means they understood these guys have not been through our Jewish rabbinical schools. But notice, they marveled. It was amazing. Look at how bold these guys are. And they took knowledge of them. What did they take knowledge of? Something about the Lord rubbed off on these men. Do you see this? They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Have you spent any time with Jesus in his word? Because the more we read about Jesus, the more we say, I can. And you don't say, I can't, or it's not my problem. We say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Have we spent time with Jesus? Because if we have, that boldness can't help but rub off just like it did on Peter and John. There, there's one. One's enough. But let's look at two more. Notice Acts 13 and verse 46. What about around your countrymen? What about around your, your people that you respect? Would Paul preach the gospel to his own countrymen? Would he deal with who his literal countrymen were? Or was he scared of them? Acts 13, 46, then Paul and Barnabas, what happened? Waxed bold. And sometimes we've got to say what needs to be said. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that is the Jews, but seeing he put it, they put the word of God from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Let's start with the people we've established credibility with, but if they turn us away, we'll teach anybody, anybody, anywhere. Do you see that? Sometimes it might be best to start with those we have a relationship with, but they might not hear it. And when they reject it, what are we going to do? Be like a whipped dog and stick her tail between her legs and go on whimpering back to the doghouse? No. We keep our heads high. We've done nothing wrong. Paul and Barnabas had done nothing wrong. Say, look, you don't want it. We'll go somewhere else. Somebody wants it. One more. Notice Acts 19 and verse number 8. Notice this word bold or some form thereof. Acts 19, 8, and he, that's Paul, went into the synagogue. He went where they went. He was among them. Human interaction is inevitable. He went into the synagogue and spake. I didn't write that. That modifies the way in which he spoke. We're trying just to start speaking. And Paul not only spoke, but he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God, the Lord's church, the one true church, the church of Christ. Do we have any courage? Because once we hit the first four, number five is going to be obvious. As we remain faithful in evangelism, conversions will occur. It might take time, but conversions will occur. False religions with a false gospel cannot save, though they can and often do muddy the water. Denominationalism is evil. Denominationalism is evil. It does nothing whatsoever to help the spiritual condition of the lost. Brethren, we have to remain diligent and determined to teach, preach, and practice all the counsel of God. That's Bible language, by the way, Acts 20 and verse 27. Now, may we never grow weary in well-doing and quit too soon. Don't give up. Some of you have already checked out in the sermon, I can tell. That's okay, you check out. Bye. Somebody's listening. And God's word will not return void, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. Let me give you some passages to consider. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and to the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25, Seeing you purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By what, Peter? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Do you see the power of God's word? One more. Romans 1, 16 to 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. How much more do you need? The power's in God's word. The power's not in us. The power's in God's word. All we have to do is get God's word to the honest and good heart. And then there'll be, there'll be conversions. Will we be found faithful in evangelism when Christ returns to deliver up the kingdom to God? If the Lord comes back today and he says, I'm going to evaluate the Lexington Church of Christ on how faithful they've been in evangelism. It's pass fail. It ain't A, B, C, D. It's either we did it or we didn't. Where are we? Gospel preaching is designed to help, not hinder. We want everyone to go to heaven. Do you want to go? You want to go? You're ready to go. I know you're ready to go. But do you, are you ready to go to heaven? You've got to hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Believe the gospel, John 8, 24. Repent of sin. Acts 3.19. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Romans 10.9 and 10. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. If you don't like that, read 1 Peter 3.21. It's plain. The light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. When you, been, when you obey the gospel, you'll be added by the Lord to the church. Acts 2.41. Acts 2.47. You've been raised up to walk in newness of life. You're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your past sins have been washed away. And now we've become a servant of righteousness, but righteousness, but sometimes even faithful servants sin. You can fix that here today and at home. It's Acts 8, 22. What, what happens once I'm in Christ and I sin? What must I do? Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray thou. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Wherever you are, come now. Let's together we stand as we sing a song of encouragement.